Okay, so uh, welcome back again, and uh, we shall now uh, continue with the next sutta on the list, which is uh, Majjhimanikaya 26, uh, known as the Arya Pariyasana Sutta in the Pali language, the Noble Search. And uh, this Majjhimanikaya, of course, uh, is the middle length sayings of the Buddha, uh, the 26th sutta in that collection. And these are some of the most beautiful suttas in the whole Pali collection because they are quite long, so they're quite complete, uh, and they often have quite a bit of narrative around them. You get a feeling for who the Buddha was as a person, which is often quite nice. And so they are kind of complete teachings, whereas many of the shorter teachings elsewhere are not really quite complete in, the, in this uh, sense. And uh, the, uh, this particular sutta is uh, an autobiographical sutta uh, of the Buddha before his awakening. Yeah? So the Buddha to be, you can call him if you like. Yeah? And some of the, to me, some of the most beautiful suttas in the whole Pali Canon uh, are precisely these autobiographical suttas. Uh, where the Buddha talks about his own life, how he practiced, uh, uh, how he reached awakening, what he had to do and all of these kind of things. Uh, and uh, you can imagine it's quite personal, right, when you hear about the life of the Buddha and how he talks about himself. Uh, and it kind of get close to the kind of his spiritual uh, endeavor and his spiritual uh, kind of the things that he went through to achieve this. And it's quite touching to read some of these things. It brings you a sense of who the Buddha was and who the Buddha to be was. Uh, and one of the remarkable things that you actually discover very quickly uh, is that the Buddha to be has much in common with us. Uh, yeah, it's like he had these defilements, he had wrong view, he was attached to things in the world. Uh, and the kind of the more you read about these things, the more you recognize that uh, the gulf between us and the Buddha to be is not really there isn't really any gulf at all. Uh, it's just slightly differences maybe in personality slightly differences in spiritual powers, yeah, the Buddha was obviously very powerful spiritually, uh, and that kind of made him special, that enabled him to make this breakthrough and to become the Buddha eventually, yeah. but it's very encouraging, yeah, and um, the obvious reason why the Buddha gives these autobiographical suttas uh, is obviously to encourage us to do likewise, uh, yeah, he's saying this is what I did, you should be doing the same thing, yeah. Yeah, you're not fundamentally different from what I am, and because we are fundamentally the same, we should be practicing the same way. So it's like an um, encouragement to us to follow in his footsteps. In fact, it says elsewhere in the sutta that the Buddha specifically mentions that we are to follow his example. Yeah, so he lays down, this is what I did, you should do the same thing. Yeah. So when we read uh, these suttas, we should read that with this kind of in the background, the back of our minds. Uh, the idea is that we should be following and doing the same thing as the Buddha to be. Uh, and this is one of the benefits of seeing the Buddha as human, just like we are human. Uh, because if the Buddha is not human, if he's some kind of completely different kind of entity, uh, I don't know, the ground of all consciousness or the Dhamma principle or, I don't know, someone who has been striving for Buddhahood for four incalculable eons, uh, it kind of makes him different, right? He's not really one of us anymore. And you wonder what his practice has got to do with our practice. Uh, and you think, okay, the Buddha's over here, we're over here. Okay, it's a nice story, but it's got nothing to do with me. Uh, and that will be missing the point. So sometimes... Uh, some of these later mythology and legends that were written down or composed about the Buddha after his passing away, they actually distance us from the Buddha and they make some of these teachings less accessible, less immediately important to us because we're talking about different kinds of beings. So this is one of the reasons why it is so important to see the Buddha as human because these teachings only make sense in that particular context. Well, I should say the Buddha to be as human. The Buddha, of course, was a little bit different, but uh, certainly the Buddha to be him. So, uh, this sutta then is called the Noble Search. Yeah, which is like a nice and evocative title right there. We're going to search for that which is noble in the world. And, uh, of course, noble here has this idea that we're searching for that which ennobles the mind makes the mind more pure. Yeah, it's like the inner nobility, 
the external nobility is kind of irrelevant in Buddhism, but the inner nobility, uh, kind of a high mind, uh, the idea of purifying yourself and making yourself into a better person. Uh, so this is kind of a already very nice idea, the noble search, searching for those things that ennoble us, make us better human beings. Uh, and uh, uh, also, of course, that nobility has to do with moving towards something really worthwhile, yeah? something which actually gets you out of trouble, moves you towards a real goal. Uh, one of the uh, qualities of the Dhamma that you find talked about in the suttas is Sa'atanga. And Sa'atta means literally having an Atta. And an Atta here does not mean soul. It's not that kind of Atta. It doesn't, there's no soul in this. There's the Atta here is the uh, meaning or purpose or goal. So there's a teaching with a real goal, a real purpose, a real aim that stops this eternal wandering around in samsaric existence. Uh, well, this is what this uh, noble search is about. Uh, so uh, we are, this is just an extract of a very long sutta. And uh, if you're interested, I would really recommend you to read the sutta. It's really, to my mind anyway, very inspiring, very interesting. Uh, but because uh, we only have seven days, we can only do so much. Uh, so we have to be satisfied with a few extracts. Um, as you can tell, every sutta takes a long time because you have to uh, really uh, you know, delve into the details to make it meaningful and uh, to give it any sense of purpose for this retreat. Uh, so um, here we have a situation where the monks are all sitting together and they're having a Dhamma discussion in a hall, right? Uh, and um, I haven't included this actually part prior to this that is really quite nice. Uh, so what happens in this Hall, which is quite fascinating here. Um, see if I can remember it. I don't have to bring it up. So the Buddha has been asked if he can come to give a talk to the monks out of compassion. Yeah, and you, when you ask the Buddha, you always ask, "Can you please come out of compassion?" That is the right way of phrasing things. If you want to talk by someone like the Buddha or maybe some other important teacher, yeah, please come out of compassion. You are kind of, a, a, you know, you sort of a, trying to. A, you're asking for them, you know, please help us because we understand we're in trouble. And so if you ask someone for help, someone who's compassionate, they will come as a consequence. And um, so the Buddha then approaches this building where he knows that all the monks are assembled. Yeah? And when he comes to the building, yeah, he hears that the monks are on the inside having a discussion. So what does he do? He waits outside the door for the discussion to come to an end. Right? This is the Buddha, right? He doesn't just kind of walk in. He doesn't have any sense of entitlement. Yeah, I'm the boss. I can do whatever I want. There's nothing like that. He actually is more polite than most people. He waits outside while they're having the discussion. That's kind of actually a very important point. I don't know if you have noticed sometimes that people who are in positions of authority, and this happens, of course, in positions of spiritual authority as well, that people often have a sense of entitlement. Yeah, I'm entitled to do because I'm more important or something like that. But the example of the Buddha is actually the opposite. He's actually super polite. He behaves according to normal norms. He behaves like an ordinary person. He doesn't put himself above anyone. That's kind of something very inspiring about that. It's something that we even forget in the present day. Uh, sometimes because uh, mo sometimes because monastics maybe they are too uh, revered. Maybe not so much in the West because in the West people are pretty kind of egalitarian and they kind of tell you what they think straight out. It's not <laughs> usually happens. But sometimes in Buddhist countries, right, the monastics are put on the pedestal. Uh, and sometimes, in some countries more than other countries, and they give a Dhamma talk and you think, what was that all about? And everyone goes, sadhu, 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 what a wonderful Dhamma talk. What? <laughs> it's like whatever you say is kind of, wow, this is wonderful, because, simply because you're wearing some brown robes. Or, you know, you are, you are treated like royalty sometimes in Thailand. I'm just kind of amazed sometimes. I go to these places and they treat you as if you are something... <laughs> Some, somehow out beyond this world or something like that. Uh, and um, it is sometimes you're treated far better than the Buddha was ever treated. Uh, that makes you feel a bit awkward when you read the suttas and you see how the Buddha behaved uh, and somehow you are treated better than the Buddha. Uh, 
that doesn't feel, seem remotely right. And so it's kind of interesting to see the Buddha and how he lives in a fairly ordinary way. Yeah, it's just he behaves in a very kind of natural way. And in this case, he then waits outside the door, and when the conversation comes to an end, then he coughs, you know, to make his presence felt. So they don't, he doesn't just barge in through the door, he coughs. And then someone from the inside comes and they open the door for him. And then he comes in, and he sits down, and then he washes his own feet. These days, if you're a monk, people wash your feet for you. In those days, the Buddha washed his own feet. Again, it's kind of interesting to read these things. And uh, then he sits down, and when he sits down, he asks the assembled monks, he asks them, well, what were you discussing? Yeah, he kind of takes that as the basis for his, uh, his talk. Yeah, what were you discussing? Yeah. And they say, oh, we were discussing about the Buddha. Yeah, you, uh, they're usually very polite in the way they speak, by the way. So they, you know, they never, never use the word you. They will always say something, oh, we're discussing the Bhagavad, the Blessed One. Yeah. Or was the third person that would be the, considered the appropriate way of addressing him. Yeah. And this is then the background for how the why the Buddha talks about his own life. Yeah? And this is kind of really, uh, uh, so this is kind of how it works. And uh, so I found this interesting because, uh, I don't know, as a monk, it's good to kind of recognize how, you know, you need to be careful uh, with your life sometimes. Uh, and in the West, I think it's quite nice because in the West it's quite egalitarian, it's not, it doesn't have that kind of... Uh, but sometimes in some places you can really be... things can be kind of get a little bit out of all proportions the way things are done. Uh, anyway, so then uh, the Buddha comes into the hall and then uh, he says uh, to the mendicants or to the monks or maybe the nuns were there as well, I'm not sure. Uh, it says the following, good mendicants, sir. It is appropriate for gentlemen like you, uh, who have gone forth in faith from the lay life to homelessness, uh, to sit together and talk about the teaching. Uh, when you're sitting together, you should do one of two things. Uh, discuss the teaching uh, or keep noble silence. <laughs> yeah, so first of all, you have gone forth out of faith from the lay life to homelessness, yeah, not for some other reason. You have confidence in his teachings, so that's what kind of makes you become a monastic. Yeah. That's already quite nice, so it's confidence, and because, if, because you have gone forth in confidence, it is appropriate that you should practice according to these teachings. And so you sit together and you discuss the teachings. You should do one of two things, either discuss the Dhamma or keep noble silence. And so this is why we have noble silence on retreats like this. So please keep that in mind. It is often easy to start kind of falling away a little bit from that. But remember that the other people on this retreat, they really appreciate it if you're able to keep that silence. So, so be careful. It's very, you can easily hear in the corridors when you walk around. If you do talk, then people guaranteed will hear you talking. So be careful with that. And again, it's this idea of something beautiful happening. It's called noble silence, because it is supposed to be noble, not something painful, but something positive that enhances your qualities yeah, on this path. So you do one of these two things. So everything we do in Buddhism is kind of geared towards progress. This does not mean that you should be impolite and you should never kind of say, how are you? Because that doesn't say in the Dhamma, how are you? So I can't say that. It's okay to kind of be polite with people. Not only is it okay, actually it is a must. And the Buddha himself is very polite. He's very friendly. He asks people how they are, whether they had enough to eat, whether they've come from far away, whether they're tired and these kind of things. And he does that in many places in the Sutta. So. But uh, no need to exaggerate the politeness, no need to keep the small talk going for long periods of time, right? Uh, oh, the weather, whatever. <laughs> so you just keep it within reason. Yeah. So, um, uh, so that is uh, what he starts out by saying. And now he, he, he continues, as mendicants, there are these two searches, uh, the noble search and the ignoble search. So there are things you should search for that are noble and things that you should not search for that are kind of not really noble. And what is the ignoble search? 
And uh, it will come to no surprise, perhaps, that uh, the vast majority of people are engaged in the ignoble search. It is when someone who is themselves liable to be reborn seeks what is also liable to be reborn. Themselves liable to grow old, fall sick, die, sorrow, or become corrupted, they seek what is also liable to these things. Yeah, so these things are mentioned because they are obviously problematic. Yeah, all of these things are not really <laughs> things that we really want. Yeah, this rebirth might be a little bit tricky to know whether you want it or not. This will depend on the person. But if you understand the Dhamma properly, you understand that it is a serious problem. Maybe the biggest of all the problems. And all of these other things are pretty obviously not things that we want. And I'll come back to this in a second why these things are problematic and how to think about them. And what should be described as liable to be reborn? <coughs> Partners and children, male and female bond servants, goats and sheep, chickens and pigs, elephants and cattle are liable to be reborn. These attachments or these, uh, uh, these uh, possessions, is another word we can use here, are liable to be reborn. Someone who is tired, infatuated, and attached to such things, themselves liable to be reborn, seeks what is also liable to be reborn. So, um, here, first of all, we have the idea of re reborn, yeah, or rebirth, and the Pali word behind this is jati, and jati is normally translated into English as birth and not rebirth. And so the question is, which one is correct, birth or rebirth? Now, if you look at the word in its own right, it actually means some, It means birth, basically. Yeah, it doesn't necessarily have the connotations of rebirth. So is it then right to call it rebirth? And the answer is, I think, yes. And the reason why it is correct to... Uh, translated this as a rebirth is that in the Indian context, uh, any instance of birth uh, is also an instance of rebirth. Uh, for them, it wouldn't make much difference. Yeah, if you said birth, everyone would understand rebirth. Uh, whereas in our modern world, in a society, you know, in Western Europe or European society or many other societies around the world, uh, birth has absolutely nothing to do with rebirth. Uh, you would never even consider that possibility unless it was stated. Uh, so for us to read the same thing as the ancient Indians were reading, uh, the only way you can do that is to bring out that connotation uh, out of the word uh, and actually state it explicitly. Uh. And so I think it actually is correct to translate this as rebirth uh, or reborn because it actually just makes clear what is implied for those listeners at that time, uh, but which we would never actually hear in that word. Uh. And these are the subtleties of translation. Yeah? You want the audience to hear the same thing as they heard at that time. And the only way you can do that in this context is to translate it as rebirth. Now, if you know the Four Noble Truths, you will know that the First Noble Truth starts with birth is suffering, or maybe it should be rebirth is suffering. Hmm. Yeah, always you have birth is suffering, but maybe that translation is not really all that useful. So it goes birth is suffering, illness is suffering, old age is suffering, death is suffering, being separated from what you like is suffering, being associated with what you don't like is suffering. Yeah, this is kind of how the first noble truth goes, if you know your first noble truth. If you don't, don't worry, it's okay. But just, yeah, so it starts with the idea of jati, jati pidukkha. Birth or rebirth is something. So which one is it? Is it birth or rebirth? Hmm. Now the second noble truth is about the cause of suffering. The third noble truth is about overcoming suffering. So what kind of birth can you possibly overcome? You cannot possibly overcome the birth you already had. That's already finished. It's done with. It's in the past. You can't overcome that. So it must mean must refer to future birth. That's the only dukkha you can overcome as far as birth is concerned. So actually, right there in the first noble truth, the meaning of jati must be rebirth. Rebirth is the problem. And that's kind of interesting, right? Because what that means then is that 
uh, all of these other terms like old age and death, uh, they also have a similar kind of connotation. So it's like re-old age and re-death. Yeah? These are the real issues. Uh, because that is the carrying on of samsaric existence, going on and on and on and on. Uh. So maybe ideally, uh, and this is where Bhante Sujato didn't kind of follow up fully, uh, should be birth, should be rebirth. Uh, old age should be re-old age. Uh, death should be re-death. Uh. Maybe it becomes a bit artificial at a certain point. Uh, <laughs> But uh, yeah, so that's kind of what is actually going on there. It kind of points to the cycle of existence. Uh, and this is why rebirth right here is actually very meaningful, yeah? Because there is an understanding here that the whole process of rebirth is actually inherently problematic. Yeah? That is kind of the point that is actually being made here. Yeah? There's an understanding that there is a serious issue at stake. Yeah? And uh, for many people, rebirth sounds like a uh, nice thing, yeah, because you get reborn. I don't want to be annihilated, for goodness sake. I want to kind of hang out and enjoy some more and carry on my spiritual path and gradually purify myself. But uh, actually, that is a shallow understanding of what is going on. Uh, it is much deeper than that. There's a very serious problems going on. Uh, and the Buddha says elsewhere, actually later on in this sutta, that there are people who do understand this problem right away, right? To understand that actually this is a worrying thing, this idea that things carry on in this way. And the Buddha, being one of the greatest spiritual masters at that time, the potential already being there, of course he would be one of those who understood the danger in that. So rebirth is suffering. Rebirth is a problem. And if things are re if I already have this problem, do I really want to go out and attach to other things that have the same problem? Uh, you can see why that just makes things worse, right? Uh, you already you, there's a problem for you. Maybe I should solve my own problem rather than kind of making it worse. Uh, this is the distinction between the noble search and the ignoble search. Uh, the noble search tries to find a solution to the problem. Uh, the ignoble search makes the problem worse. Uh, and so this is why the Buddha is making this kind of distinction here. So, um, one other thing that is interesting about this, uh, and this here is this idea that, remember this we are now dealing with the Buddha to be. This is before his awakening. He doesn't really have any great insight yet into the nature of existence. Uh, and yet he seems to assume the idea of rebirth. Uh, and this is one of those interesting discussions that you have in Buddhism sometimes. Yeah? And you have some people who say that, yeah, yeah, you kind of rebirth is just a kind of cultural baggage from the past and you kind of bring it into the Dhamma, actually got nothing to do with Buddhism. And uh, so the question is, is that correct? Or did the Buddha actually discover rebirth? Because here it seems like it is cultural baggage. Maybe the cultural baggage crowd are right. <laughs> This is like a cultural baggage crowd, right? It's not, it's not the, maybe they're correct, right? Because here it seems to be assumed. But at the same time, we also know that the Buddha did investigate these things. We know that he did remember his past lives. We know that there were people at that time who were materialists, who said that when you die, everything comes to an end. And the Buddha knew about these people. So as always, the situation is a bit complicated. Yeah? There isn't kind of one right way there seems to have been a general idea of rebirth, but the Buddha also investigated that, or the Buddha to be investigated at the same time. Both of those seem to be true. So um, that, I think, is the right way of thinking about this. Yes, these ideas were part of that society, but the Buddha, being the Buddha, didn't take anything for granted, and he investigated these things, which is abundantly clear in the suttas. So that kind of puts a bit more nuance to view on that whole idea, that whole debate of uh, whether it is a cultural baggage or whether it is a real insight of the Buddha. Anyway, I'm not sure if that interests you, but uh, I thought I would just mention it anyway. Yeah. Um, so what are these things that are liable to be reborn? Yeah, partners and children, of course. Uh, male and female bond servants. Uh, I don't know if you know what a bond servant is, but it's like a... Uh, Slave, really? It's kind of a nice kind of slave, a slave that is treated not quite like a slave, but treated a bit nice, more nicely. So I, I wrote to Vanda Sudato and I said to him, well, bond servant, I don't think anyone understands the word bond servant. I need a dictionary next to them, so maybe we should just call it a slave. But he was adamant that bond servant is precisely the right word in this context. So 
and he's probably right. So I thought, okay, whatever, let's do we put bombs through <laughs> all the servants in there. So, uh, uh, but it, it's kind of not this bond, bond servant, it's a bonded servant, right? That's kind of the idea. Bond, like bonded labor, you're bound, you can't really, uh, not really allowed to do what you want. Okay, uh, goats and sheep, yeah, obviously liable to be reborn, yeah, animals too are liable to be reborn, chickens and pigs, elephants and cattle. Yeah? And the reason why all of these things are mentioned, it sounds a bit strange from a modern context, because this is the kind of usual things in ancient Indian households. You would have all of this stuff because this is how you survived. In fact, your wealth was very often measured in terms of how many animals you had. Yeah, How much cattle did you have? How many elephants did you have? And if you were really wealthy, you had heaps of these things. And the Brahmins of old, they often had lots of cattle. They were, the wealth of the Brahmin was counted in the number of heads of cattle that they had. In fact, even today, if you have a wealthy farmer, you would be, probably be counted a little bit like that. All of these things are liable to be reborn, yet yeah, these possessions are liable to be reborn. If you are tied, infatuated, and attached to these things, that is when you are said to be seeking what is liable to be reborn. Yeah, because if you are attached to these things, you have an interest in them, you have an interest in, in their future, in how they kind of, uh, what happens to them. And that is kind of seeking, in a sense, uh, those things. Uh, yeah, and you are seeking certain outcomes, if you like, because of your attachments. Uh, and uh, that is really the problem. The attachment is the problem. Uh, yeah, the infatuation is the problem. Uh, that is the issue at stake. Uh, this is what we're trying to deal with here. And this is what the Buddha-to-be sees before his awakening. Uh, and that is why we should try also to see that same problem. Uh, I don't know if you have ever felt, met, felt in yourself the feeling of attachment and sometimes experienced powerfully, viscerally within yourself the danger in that, uh, feeling how that attachment is bound to give rise to suffering in the future. Uh, have you ever felt that experience where you know that I'm attaching to someone or something or something? Yeah? And this feeling, this knowledge straight away that this will give rise to a lot of pain in the future. Yeah? Because that attachment will be broken at some point. Yeah? And sometimes you can, when you see it happening, yeah, you can actually feel the consequences if you're very alert to what is going on. It's like, wow, oh, this is really scary here. Yeah? Yeah, attachments, uh, the moment you attach, uh, the moment you really hold on to something, at that moment uh, you're asking for suffering here. Yeah. Notice that in yourself, and the whole idea of attachment can become actually quite repulsive when you see that. Uh, you want to be really careful down the track, not to attach to more at least, or get attached to enough things already, uh, let me not kind of go any further here. Uh. And this is what insight is about, just li seeing little things like that in yourself, understanding that, uh, and you kind of are moving in the right direction, you're starting to let go because you see that you're putting your hand on the hot plate. Oof, pull it back straight away. No, no will is required. All right, let's go on. And what should be described as liable to grow old? Partners and children, male and female bond servants, goat and sheep, chickens and pigs, Elephants and cattle are liable to grow old. These possessions or these attachments are liable to grow old. Someone who is tied, infatuated and attached to such things, themselves liable to grow old, seeks what is also liable to grow old. Yeah, growing old is painful, is diff difficult. Uh, things start to fall apart, uh, your eyesight gets worse, you have to wear glasses. Uh, it's a bit of a hassle to have to wear glasses, you, or, you know. And uh, all kind of things happen as you grow. The older you get, the worse it tends to be. Yeah, yeah kind of you get weak and things really getting difficult. Uh, and so get going old is problematic. Yeah. So if you have a problem yourself again, you don't want to attach to other things that have exactly the same problem. Yeah. And it's painful to see people around you grow old as well. Yeah, yeah it is not nice. Yeah. And uh, I can see that sometimes I speak to my mother, she's getting very old now, uh, and she says to me, oh, I've got a son who's almost 60. Uh, and she's kind of horrified at that idea. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, 
and I say that's okay, it's all right. This you know doesn't necessarily not necessarily so ter- such a terrible thing. It's better to be sixty than not to be sixty at all. That's kind of far worse. So if you never get to sixty, always that's a much bigger problem. Huh? And you can see that uh, for a mother, kind of seeing her children getting old, it's not such a nice thing, you know, right? It's kind of scary. Huh? I guess it reminds her how old she must be if her son is sixty. Well, how old am I then? Huh? And uh, so that's kind of what happens. So growing old is difficult. Seeing the people around you grow old, and of course, feeling it yourself is probably uh, is even worse in many ways. Uh. And what should be described as liable to fall sick? Partners and children, male and female bond servants, goats and sheep, chickens and pigs, elephants and cattle are liable to fall sick. These possessions are liable to fall sick. Someone who is tired, infatuated, and attached to such things themselves liable to falling sick, seeks what is also liable to fall sick. I'll talk more about each one of these in a, in a lot more detail further down, but now we're just looking at the ignoble searcher. And then when we look at the noble searcher, we're going to talk about these things in detail. So I'm just going to pass through it fairly quickly now. What should be described as liable to die? Partners and children, male and female bond servants, goats and sheep, chickens and pigs, elephants and cattle are liable to die. Very repetitive. These attachments are liable to die. Someone who is tired, infatuated and attached to such things, themselves liable to die, seeks what is also liable to die. Mm-hmm. Death, death is kind of one of the really big things in life. Yeah, It is kind of the thing which is... Um, uh, most concerning about life uh, and most interesting at the same time. Uh, and that's why people tend to fear death uh, because of the unknown, the uncertainty. Uh. Anyway, let's, I'll come back to this later on. Uh. What should be described as liable to sorrow? Uh, partners and children, male and female bond servants, goats and sheep, pickings, chickens and pigs, elephants and cattle are liable to sorrow. Uh. These attachments are liable to sorrow. Someone who is tired, infatuated, and attached to such things, uh, themselves liable to sorrow, seeks what is also liable to sorrow. Uh, and this is kind of interesting. Yeah, the animals are liable to sorrow. Uh, this is the sort of thing that we have been den- in denial about in Western society for centuries. Uh, animals are like machines. They don't feel anything. You're allowed to kill them whenever you want. Uh, that has been kind of the standard view in the most of the Western world until fairly recently. It's only in recent decades that we have kind of accepted that animals actually are much more like us than we think. And these days, this is becoming an accepted thing in Western society. Of course, Buddha was there first, a long, long, long time before we started to kind of get some common sense knocked into our skulls. And now we are... <laughs> Starting to see, and it's kind of obvious, I think, for any one of you who has pets will know that this is true. Yeah, pets can be sad, they can be happy, they have emotions that are very similar to what we have as human beings. The gulf between animals and human beings actually isn't perhaps a gulf after all. It's just a small gap. Yeah, and once you start to see that, you start to see why it is possible to be reborn from one to the other. Because essentially, we are much more similar uh, than uh, we think we are. Uh, yes, human beings, and certainly there are some big advantages of being human compared to animal. Uh, but many of the uh, root things, the feelings, what we desire, how we move in the world, what we want for ourselves, what we want to avoid, uh, many of these issues are very, very similar. Uh, so uh, it's uh, an important point, and here it is really stated quite clearly, animals are subject to sorrow. Uh, kind of interesting. Uh, anyway, what should be described as liable to corruption? Uh, partners and children, uh, male and female bond servants, goats and sheep, chickens and pigs, uh, elephants and cattle, gold and money uh, are liable to corruption. Uh, These attachments are liable to corruption. Someone who is tied, infatuated, and attached to such things, uh, themselves liable to corruption, seeks what is also liable to corruption. Uh, This is the ignoble search. Uh, Corruption here in Buddhism, the the Pali word is sankilesa, and corruption in this sense means the defilements of the mind, uh, mental defilements. uh, 
So we are all liable to these kind of corruptions. And of course, what that means is that, uh, and this is kind of scary in a way, yeah? it means that, okay, maybe you are a good person now, <laughs> but depending on who you hang out with, uh, who your friends are, whether you have Kalyana Mitta or Papa Mitta, you know the Papa Mitta? Kalyana Mitta is a good friend, Papa Mitta is the bad friend, uh, right? Uh, if you have too many Papa Mittas, uh, you're in trouble and you may be heading for more defilements. Uh, because we become uh, who we hang out with. Uh, that is kind of the Buddhist message. You don't become what you eat. That's kind of the modern notion. No, you become who you are with, uh, right? Uh, it's your body that becomes what you eat, but the body is irrelevant. Uh, the mind is what matters, and the body, the mind, becomes who you are with, what you have, you condition yourself. Uh, so you become uh, who your mates are. Uh, mates is kind of what we say in Australia. Uh, and uh, so your friends, your companions, that is what is so important. Uh, and sometimes you get corrupted, and sometimes you are in the wrong company or the right company and become more pure. And it's a bit random. Uh, how did we end up as Buddhists in this life? Uh, kind of hard to know sometimes, isn't it? Uh, it's very sort of uh, haphazard. It's like, okay, these things happened, uh, and it's kind of very uncertain. Will you be a Buddhist in your next life? Uh, maybe you won't. Uh, will you be a Buddhist in two years' time? For those of you who are quite new to Buddhism, uh, maybe, maybe you think it's cool in the beginning, uh, but then you have some bad experiences and you give it up. Uh, what happens then? Uh? So this is so uncertain. Uh, it is so unreliable. Uh, yeah, the mind goes up and down. That gives sense to, gives rise to a sense of urgency. Now is the opportunity to do something. Uh, if I don't do things now, uh, it may never happen. Uh, because the uncertainty of the conditioning we get uh, from the world around us. Uh, the more you understand this idea of conditioning and being the result, uh, the pers your personality being the result of external influences, the more you see that, uh, the more scary it becomes. Uh, because it feels like we have all this autonomy. It feels like we have a sense of free will to do what we want. But do you really have that? Or are you entirely uh, an, uh, automat an automatic kind of, uh, you know, going down automatic road? Uh, what is it called? The, uh, automaton, I think is the word, is it? So you're kind of following according to all of this program written into you. Uh, and the more you see that the sense of self is an illusion of control, an illusion of free will, the more you get that, the more kind of scary it all seems. And you think, well, now I have the wisdom to read these teachings. Now I have the chance to do something with it. I better take this opportunity. If I don't take it now, what's going to happen down the track? Don't become paralyzed with fear, that's also silly, huh? but feel the sense that, okay, it matters, it matters enormously. What I do moment to moment matters enormously. Huh? Let me take this opportunity now. Huh? And um, this is kind of the right way huh, of thinking about this. You get corrupted, you get born into this world, you're already corrupted, you already have wrong view, you already have wrong perspective and perceptions. Huh? Now is a chance to sort those things out, uh, align your view, align the way of thinking uh, with the way, where the Buddha saw the world. Uh, then uh, there is a chance. Uh, and of course, all of these uh, animals and people, they are also liable to corruption, right? Uh, you get married, you have a partner, and then you realize actually they weren't quite as you thought they were. They would turn out to be different, uh, or they get changed after you get married to them. And then you have children, they're also liable to corruption. They're very cute when they're small, uh, and they're not so cute when they become teenagers. Uh. And then you, uh, you realize, oh, I, what have I got myself into? Uh, <laughs> so I think I was very cute when I was small, and I became uncute later on. Uh, and now I'm getting a bit more cute again, hopefully. Uh, that's even my theory anyway. <laughs> This is how it goes sometimes, uh, so you kind of go into this wave. So. And then you, yeah, anyway, I'll, I won't go any further into that. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, so, yeah, things are, and then the last thing here is the idea of gold and silver, yeah, or gold and money becoming corrupted. Uh. Sometimes you don't know what you get. Uh. Sometimes you don't know what things are in the world, whether they are real or not. Uh. Is someone trying to trick you? Uh. And of course, gold and money that is corrupt, that is fake, that is a counterfeit, uh, doesn't have any value. Huh? Yeah, it, it, it loses its value. In the same way, a person that gets corrupted uh, loses their value. Huh? Yeah, it is no longer interesting if a person, you might get 
find someone attractive because they are pure, but once they are corrupt, they don't have all of these defilements, you lose your interest in that person. Uh, corruption is a bad thing. Yeah? It makes you lose uh, the sense of attract attractiveness uh, with the things of the world. Uh, and because everything can get corrupted, everything potentially will lose its attraction towards you. Uh, to you. To you. Okay. So that is the ignoble search. Yeah? Searching for all of these things that have all of these kind of problems. Uh, and uh, you're just compounding a big problem already. Huh? So maybe we should search for a solution to the problem rather than compounding it. Uh, so now let's look at the noble search. What is the noble search? It is when someone who is themselves liable to be reborn understands the drawbacks in being liable to be reborn and seeks the unborn supreme sanctuary extinguishment. Yeah, so this is what it is about. So it is about understanding the drawbacks in being liable to be reborn. And the more you understand the problem of rebirth, the more you're going to look for the solution to that problem. The Pali word for drawback is adinava, and it is an important word, an important technical term in the Pali canon. And uh, the, in the Pali canon, you have these three words that are very important uh, that you find in many different places. And they show you the three attitudes uh, to the things in the world, right? How we look at things in the world. Uh, and these word, words are, one is asada, and asada can be translated as the gratification uh, or the positive thing in something, yeah? What, what is gratifying in something? Uh, in other words, the likable aspect of something. Uh, and that aspect we are really good at seeing already. Yeah? We are incredibly, we see the gratification in everything in the sensory world. We understand this. In fact, we don't understand it because we overdo the gratification side massively. We think that there is more gratification than there actually is. So even on the gratification side, there is a problem. So to balance that out, we need to look at the adinava, which is the drawback or the downside of the things in the world. And we need to focus on that. That is where we are not very good at seeing the downside of things. And that is why we keep on getting attached, keep on holding on to things, not seeing the higher things that are of real value in our life, but holding on to the lower things. So we are trapped in the lower realm within our own minds. That is the problem. So you understand the drawbacks, contemplate the drawbacks. What does rebirth really mean? What does it entail in the long run if I keep on getting reborn? Is it, what are the consequences of this? Yeah, and it's not so hard to see if you have been reborn a thousand times, yeah, a million times, and you have basically the same kind of life again and again and again, right? You do the same thing. What if you have to live your life you had now a thousand times? Would that be satisfactory? Are you ready to do exactly the same mistakes, exactly the same things, a thousand times more into the future? I don't know about you, but I have to admit I had a pretty good life. If I look back on my life, I had good parents, a good family, well off, I got a good education, I was you know, reasonably intelligent, I was completely thick when I was a child or at school, I did reasonably well. I had everything really in life, I can't really complain about anything, I can't can complain about a lot actually, but I'm not going to do that. But overall, I look at my life, I think, I had a really blessed life. It doesn't get that much better than that, really. But would I want to do it again? Absolutely no way. Still, there was heaps of dukkha along the way. The best kind of life in the human realm is full of problems. Yeah, it is all kind of things, heartaches and falling in love and then kind of all the problems that that you know, has to do with going to school and having problems at school sometimes and all these kind of things. All of these things in life that actually are pain and always problematic. And then having to work and sometimes working too hard and getting exhausted and I don't know. It's, when I look back, the idea of having to do this again even once is enough, let alone a thousand times. Of course, the problem is that when you die, you've forgotten all those mistakes. You haven't really learned very much. Yeah, you start out, you come, go back to square one. It's like the snake and ladders. You fall down the longest kind of, uh, what is it? You get bitten by the snake and you fall down, something like that. Uh, and you come back to almost to square one again. Uh, and you start over. And it goes on and on like this. Uh, 
And when you start to see this, uh, it really feels really awful. Uh, in one sense, it's good that we don't remember our past lives, uh, right? because in one sense you would feel really horrified if you did. Uh, in another sense, it's terrible, because it, that lack of insight means that you haven't got the motivation to really uh, practice fully. Uh, if you saw your past lives, uh, wow, you would be really inspired to get out of this mess uh, very, very quickly. Uh, so this is the idea of seeing the drawback of rebirth, yeah? seeing the big picture in things. Uh, we are usually trapped in this very narrow little picture of the world. Uh, we see this one life, and even this one life we don't see very clearly, but it's only a tiny sliver of existence, this one life. Uh, and it actually extends out in both into the past and the future, almost without any limit at all. Uh, and when you start to see that, uh, this is really problematic. And you can imagine why, how it is that the Buddha actually was able to achieve awakening on the night of his awakening. The reason was because precisely because they remembered his past lives. He really understood the problem. Seeing your past life is one of the ways of getting insight into dukkha, suffering, seeing it clearly. So the Buddha, when he remembered his past life, that was, in a way, seeing the first noble truth. Yeah, that's what he saw. Not fully, but very close to fully. And so he saw that, and that is then what enabled him to, number two, understanding karma, because karma is the driver of this process. And once he understood the driver and the problem, then he could let go of the whole thing, and he could overcome the sense of self, which is so incredibly hard to overcome, because it's so dear to us. You need a very, very powerful uh, motivation, uh, uh, incitement, or whatever you want to call it, to overcome the sense of self. Uh, and that was required for the Buddha to be here. So this is the uh, seeing the drawbacks. Yeah? So rebirth here, of all of these things that we're, look, we're looking at now, is probably the most powerful one. Yeah? Now, the problem is that uh, rebirth, even though it is the most powerful one, yeah, it is also a little bit theoretical. Yeah? It is not something that you can feel right away. It is something which is a bit distant from us. Yeah? And uh, so sometimes what we have to do, we have to try to gain more understanding of the idea of rebirth, yeah? having a more direct experience of it. Uh, how can we do that? Uh, and uh, one of the things that I would recommend you to do if you have the opportunity uh, is sometimes to read books about people who have near-death experiences. Uh, yeah, or look at some YouTube in videos. Yeah, There's, everything is on YouTube these days. So check out some YouTube videos. And some of these stories are extraordinarily powerful. Yeah. And uh, there was a, a, a book that was released recently called After. And this was by a fellow called Bruce Grayson, who was at the University of Virginia in the United States, one of the top universities in the US. They had a division at that university called the Uni Division of Perceptual Studies. <coughs> And he was the director, I think, of that department or something like that. And so they have a real section where all they do is they uh, look into these kind of uh, alternative phenomena. Yeah? Uh, re children who remember past lives, near-death experiences, and a variety of things like that. And it's become, becoming more and more an acceptable part of academic study. Yeah? It used to be called, called a kind of paranormal science, but these days it's becoming more... Ordinary science, really. And he is probably the world's leading authority on near-death experience. His name is Bruce Grayson. And you can check him out on the internet, or you can have a look at this book. Very fascinating. And so he goes through this large number of cases that he has seen during his own career, talks about them in detail. Yeah, And these are people who have these experiences. And at the end of the book, he kind of says, I cannot see any normal explanation for these things. He says, you know, because he wants to be scientific, he said, I don't really know why they're happening here. But I can't really see any normal explanation for these things. And he seems to be very open to alternative explanations, things that are more in line with Buddhist ideas and these kind of things. And there's something very powerful about reading these things. These are ordinary people telling their stories. You can't really just dismiss it. Yeah, it's obvious that they had some of these experiences. Uh, dismissing it seems like uh, a kind of denial almost. Of course they had these experiences. Uh, and if they cannot be explained in ordinary ways, well, maybe we should use the Buddha's explanation. Uh, maybe the Buddha was right. Uh, 
there is a rebirth, there is a moving on from one life to the next one there. In fact, if you are a Buddhist, obviously there is a rebirth there. Right? <laughs> it's, it's interesting. What, what do we take as evidence for rebirth in this world? Uh, and uh, I don't know how that happened. Uh, okay. <laughs> Um, what do we take as evidence for rebirth in this world? Uh, yeah? And uh, uh, to me, yes, there is all of these kind of scientific things going on and people trying to figure out the memories from children who remember past lives and near-death experiences and a large variety of other things that are very interesting. Yeah? Uh, but to me, the most important piece of evidence for rebirth uh, is that the Buddha said that there is rebirth. Uh, why would the Buddha say there is rebirth if there is no rebirth? Can you even call yourself a Buddhist if you dismiss the idea of rebirth as nonsense? And I would say this is very dicey because you're saying that the Buddha didn't know what he was talking about. If you think the Buddha didn't know what he was talking about, are you really a Buddhist? Kind of a bit on the edge there. You're, it's okay to say you don't know about rebirth and that you are investigating it. That is fine. But dismissing it is going too far because then you are denying the Buddha's insight into the nature of reality. And the whole point is that we are here because we have some confidence into the Buddha's insight into the nature of reality. And so we think that it is acceptable to kind of... Uh, set aside the Buddha's insight. And I think the reason we think that is because the Buddha is a distant figure. Two and a half thousand years ago, a different culture. We don't really have any feel for the Buddha. And so because of that, we kind of, okay, you know, it's kind of so uncertain and so much in the midst of history, we don't know what's going on, so we can kind of dismiss it. But that is the wrong way of thinking about it. If you go to school, when you go to school and the teacher tells you that, you know, okay, one plus one is two. Yeah, well, the teacher tells you that uh, you know, there was a second world war and uh, you know, there was a man fellow called Hitler and there, was, you know, and there was a war because of various reasons. Uh, are you going to accept that as historical fact? Or are you going to dismiss it because just the teacher is saying random stuff? Uh, you will accept it, right? Uh, normally, what is in the history books, even though we know the history books are not complete, even though we know that there is a certain bias in any kind of history, we know still there's going to be a core of truth as well to those history books. So we tend to trust the teacher when you go to school. Why do we trust the teacher? Well, why not? Because they don't have any reason to lie, they don't have any reason to tell us fairy tales. Yeah, they are, they are honest people doing an honest day's job. But these are just ordinary teachers. They are not, nothing special about these teachers. The Buddha is an extraordinary teacher with extraordinary insight, uh, with a view of reality that far exceeds anything we had. When you start to read about the Buddha and the way he lived his life, it's extremely impressive. Uh, you get the feeling of someone who really is different from us. Uh, so if you trust your teachers in school, uh, shouldn't you trust the Buddha? Uh, just, for, just because he lived two and a half thousand years ago, just because he lived in a different culture, uh, doesn't mean that he is fundamentally different from our teachers in the present day. In fact, he is fundamentally the same. He is also a teacher. And he tells you, just like the modern teacher tells you there was a Second World War, Napoleon lost the, the Battle of Waterloo, in the same way the Buddha tells you there is rebirth. That is why it is so important. Yeah, this is how you should think about it. If the Buddha says so, very good reasons to have some confidence in this. So we have to be careful. This is what I mean when I say it is important to gain a relationship with the Buddha in the same way that we have a relationship with other people in the world. Once that relationship builds up, then when the Buddha says things like there is rebirth and karma, it actually starts to become meaningful in an entirely new way. Because there's someone you trust who is teaching you in this way. And that makes the whole difference. If the Buddha remains like a mythological figure, someone who is kind of far away or whatever, then it's much more difficult to relate to these teachings in the right way. So we want to bring the Buddha into our life as a real teacher, a real person who is teaching you. You are the disciple of the Buddha. You listen to the word of the Buddha. Then these teachings become powerful. Okay. So, um,
So then you seek that you understand the drawbacks, yeah, in being liable to be reborn. And then you see what you seek, you seek the unborn supreme sanctuary uh, extinguishment. Uh, the unborn, what is that? The, what that is is uh, called the Ajata in Pali. Uh, and uh, of course, what it means in this particular case is the freedom from birth. Uh, that is the meaning. Yeah, when you say the unborn, it's kind of a little bit uh, unclear what exactly what that means. Uh, but because birth is a problem, what you are seeking is the ending of birth. Uh, yeah, you're not seeking some kind of unborn state, uh, but you're seeking liberation from that problem. Uh, the A in front uh, yeah, means it is uh, the negation. Yeah, the the, the freedom from. From birth, uh, it is called a privative prefix in English. In case you want the technical grammatical terminology, it's a privative prefix. You deprive it from its uh, normal meaning. So yes, the freedom from birth. Uh, yeah, so that's what the unborn means. It's very easy to think that when you read a word like unborn, it means a state or the unold age or the undeath. Sometimes called the deathless, but actually that too just means the freedom from death, uh, rather than the deathless as a state. So you are seeking the freedom from birth, uh, the supreme sanctuary, uh, yeah, the Anuttara Yoga Kema, and uh, th this is like yoga is exertion in Pali. Yeah, these days yoga means postures. You stand on your head, you kind of do various postures. In those days it meant exertion or spiritual exertion of any kind. So uh, when you see yoga in the suttas, you have to be careful not to misunderstand. It doesn't mean that you do these various asanas. So it's a different. Things have changed, as you would expect. So yoga kema means like rest from exertion. Yeah, and this is this idea that you have spent your whole time in samsaric existence, uh, wandering around, always exerting yourself, always being tired, uh, never really being able to rest, because you're always moving, 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 going somewhere, never allowing yourself really to relax. Uh, right? This happens before you get onto the spiritual path, uh, when we're seeking in the world, trying to achieve various things that actually turn out to be unachievable. Uh, and of course, if you're trying to achieve the unachievable, uh, you're going to be restlessly going on and on and on, never finding any real rest from exertion. Uh. And then one day you get onto the spiritual path, uh, and you practice the spiritual path, and that is still some exertion that is required on the spiritual path. Uh, and then you come to the end of the spiritual path. Uh. Actually, even before that, you come to samadhi, you come to the stillness of the mind, uh, and already you find rest from exertion for the first time in your life. Uh, complete rest. Uh, this is one of the beautiful things about meditation practice. Uh, the deeper you go, uh, the more resting, the more rested you become as a consequence. You're really resting. Uh, and that, that's why the mind gets so incredibly energized, uh, because you're no longer using the energy of the mind. You're allowing it to rebuild. Uh, you have the rest from exertion. Uh, Yoga Kema, sanctuary, he calls it here. Yeah, the idea of sanctuary. Finally, you have found a sanctuary in the world. And the sanctuary is not outside. It doesn't matter where you travel in the world. The problems are the same everywhere. Sanctuary is this beautiful inner sanctuary here where you let go of this whole search. And then you can rest for the, fir <coughs> for the first time. Rest from exertion or sanctuary. Supreme sanctuary. Extinguishment. <coughs> <coughs> Extinguishment is Nibbana. That is the word here that is translated as uh, um, extinguishment. And so you have found Nibbana. Yeah, that's pretty good. Nibbana. You think Nibbana is good? Huh? <laughs> Nibbana is good, right? According to the suttas, it is a good thing here. Yeah? And for most people, we have no idea what it is, but we still kind of reckon it's good. Uh, yeah, actually, we don't really know, but uh, it better be good, otherwise we are kind of, what are we doing here? Uh, so, uh, but of course, the way it is defined in the sutta, it is defined as the highest happiness and all of these kind of things. Nibbana paramang sukang, as it says in the Dhammapada, Nibbana is the highest happiness. And here it is translated as extinguishment. Wait a minute, extinguishment? Is that what you want? Do you want to be extinguished? This is the path to extinguishment, the path to Nibbana. Are you ready for that? Yes. <laughs> Aha, we have one. We have one taker over there. We have one sold already, sold on this idea. That's really good. 
<laughs> so great. So, okay, so, <laughs> so what, is, what exactly does it mean to be extinguished? Yeah? Well, first of all, the idea here of translating Nibbana is actually very important. Uh, very often you will find that there are a number of words in the Sutta that are left untranslated. And when they are left untranslated, you can put whatever meaning you want into those words. Yeah, and you think, yeah, Nibbana, it sounds cool. It means like, yeah, it means the highest happiness, you know, the kind of the universal consciousness or whatever. It can mean anything to you precisely because it is so undefined. It is an open word that like you can read things into according to your heart's delight. And your heart's delight is not necessarily the same thing as wisdom. Yeah? Sometimes the heart is leaning in the wrong direction. And so it is very important to translate as much of the Pali words as we can. Because at the very least it gives you some inkling, some idea of the meaning of these words. Yeah? If you leave the Pali you have no idea what's going on. Put it into English, you have at least some idea. Or put it into French or Norwegian, yeah, or Swedish. What happened to the Swedes over there? Okay, <laughs> so right. So this kind of gives you this broader idea. Uh, and so the word nibbana actually means something like extinguishment. Uh, in the suttas, we have the simile of the flame going out. Right, the flame gets extinguished. Uh, in the same way, when you attain nibbana, you get extinguished. Uh, what exactly is it that gets extinguished? Well, in this case, Nibbana is equivalent to becoming an Arahant. Very often we think of Nibbana as what happens when the Arahant dies, but actually it is not that at all in the suit, as it is what happens when the Arahant is still alive, the moment you become an Arahant. So extinguishment is the extinguishment of the defilements. Yeah, the defilements that make life so miserable. It's the extinguishment of all the ill will now. An extinguishment of delusion, of moha. That's good, isn't it? Being deluded is pretty bad, because being deluded means you cannot make good choices for yourself, because you haven't got a clue what's going on. Delusion, obviously, is bad. So if you can extinguish delusion, you can extinguish ill will, you can extinguish your stupid desires, yeah, the desires that make you restless and agitated and drive you on in samsara, if you can extinguish those things, good. There will still be some uh, very refined desires left, even for the Arahant, because if there were no desires, uh, the Arahant would not be able to function in the world. Uh, but the bad desires are all gone. Uh, so it's kind of good news. Uh, and uh, so with that extinguishment, because all the bad qualities are eliminated, all the good qualities come out. Uh, so you become full of compassion, uh, full of wisdom, uh, yeah, full of... Uh, uh, just inclining towards meditation. You can go into deep meditation like that because there's nothing stopping you anymore. <clears throat> you can experience all the Buddha bliss on the Buddhist path uh, without even trying very hard. You just sit down, close your eyes and bang, the bliss is there right away. Uh, those people who are really good meditators, they just sit down, uh, close their eyes and they kind of turn the mind towards the nimitta and bang, they go into a jhana. The whole thing just takes a few minutes at the most. Uh, and uh, while the rest of people, they kind of sit there, oh, mind is thinking, thinking, after one hour I get a little bit of peace, right? Uh, so it, it matters enormously how many defilements we have in the mind. Uh, so uh, this is the idea of extinguishment. Yeah, it's a beautiful idea. Uh, and of course, one of the most important things that we extinguish uh, is suffering itself. Uh, and when you extinguish suffering, uh, all you have left is uh, happiness, joy, sukha, nibbanang padamang sukhang. Yeah. Nibbana Padamang Sukang. Nibbana is the highest happiness. So this is this idea of extinguishment. And uh, it is uh, sometimes in the past it was translated as extinction, but extinction is a bit too negative perhaps. Uh, so I think extinguishment is, is better here. And uh, this was another discussion I had with Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi, how to translate Nibbana. And I said extinction, he said extinguishment. And he was probably right about this one here. So, um, okay, so that is uh, the idea of being reborn, yeah? And then you have all of these other things uh, that are com come up. Uh, so, um, then uh, the next thing, I'll, I'm not sure exactly where and when I should talk about these things, but uh, there is, uh, it goes on for a while. Anyway, so themselves liable to grow old, yeah, 
you seek, uh, you, you seek well, understand the drawback of being liable to grow old, seeks the un, unailing, or no, unaging rather is the word, the unaging supreme sanctuary and extinguishment. Uh, themselves liable to fall sick, uh, understanding the drawbacks and falling sick, uh, seeks the unailing supreme sanctuary extinguishment. Uh, themselves liable to die, uh, seeks the uh, undying, etc., uh, etc., et seeks the undying, the sorrowless, the uncorrupted supreme sanctuary extinguishment. Uh, this is the noble search. So you seek all of these other things, yeah, and uh, I, I do want to talk about all of these things in a bit of detail. I'm just kind of not sure when to bring it in. But, um, so you're seeking all of these other things, uh, and this is what the Buddha decides to do, yeah, when he is still a householder uh, and he decides to go forward, this is what drives the Buddha in his search for awakening here. Uh, and um, it's kind of very, very interesting here. Uh, because what you start to realize when you read this is that the things that made the Buddha go forth, the Buddha to be decided to become a monastic essentially, are actually very simple things in life. Yeah, it's just an acknowledgement of some of the very ordinary things in life that we don't like. Okay, we don't like old age, we don't like dying, we don't really want to get sick too often. Yeah, and it's kind of an acknowledgement of those very simple things. And for most of us, we just accept it. This is part of life. Okay, so you're going to get on with it and you make the most of the life you have. But for the Buddha to be here, it was different. He was not willing to just accept these things. He wanted to find a solution to these things. This is the thing that drove the Buddha to be, to become the Buddha, drove him onto the spiritual path. It's so simple. And what that shows you, it shows you the potential for the contemplation of these very simple things. If you contemplate these simple things in a very deep way, it is going to drive you onto the spiritual practice. Because it will show you that everything that we strive for in the world actually is really quite pointless. And this is what we need to do. If you want to overcome suffering, you want to solve the problems of life, this is what you have to deal with. So reflect on these things. They are important, right? These are fundamental aspects of the spiritual path. There is a beautiful sutta in the numerical discourses, the five, that talk about the five themes of contemplation uh, that everyone should be doing, whether you're a household or a monastic, whether you're a woman or a man, doesn't matter. Uh, and these five things are illness, uh, old age, death, yeah, exactly what we have here. The fourth one is that uh, everything that is... Uh, Beloved and pleasing to me must become otherwise, must become separated from me. And the last one is that you are the owner of your kamma. These are the five things that you should reflect upon again and again and again. And this is exactly what we're seeing here. And they become drivers in your spiritual practice. In fact, if you look at this and you look at other suttas where the Buddha talks about very similar kind of themes, it becomes quite obvious that the reason why we have Buddhism, the reason we have, have the Dhamma in the present day, is because someone reflected on death in a very deep way. Yeah, the Buddha's death is really the thing that unifies all of these negative qualities, that brings it together into one, because death implies old age. It also kind of implies sickness, I suppose. Uh, all of these things are being separated from all that we love and is pleasing, obviously, uh, is, uh, has to do with death as well. Uh, so death unifies all of these topics. Uh, so the fact that the Buddha contemplated the Buddha to be contemplated death in a very deep way, that is why we have the Dhamma. Yeah, Buddhism exists because someone reflected on death. That's kind of extraordinary. <coughs> and uh, the, of course, the extraordinary thing about the Buddha to be, when he saw this kind of problem in, the, in life, this kind of problem in the world, uh, death is a real problem. Uh, most people, when they know that death is a problem, they just carry on with their ordinary life. It doesn't make much difference. Yes, they get that it is a problem, but they sort of reckon there is no solution, so you might as well just get on with ordinary things in life. Uh, but the Buddha is not like that. Uh, the Buddha sees a problem that seems insurmountable to the vast majority of people, and he decides to go forth uh, and actually do something with it. Uh, this is the power of the Buddha, yeah? the power of the Buddha to be, having enough spiritual faculties uh, that you are willing and able to take on the most uh, uh, 
insurmountable spiritual challenges known to humanity, the idea of death itself, uh, trying to solve death. Uh, if you, uh, if you know, most people, if you talk about solving death, they, they would have no idea what you're talking about. What do you mean solving death? Usually it means denial about death. You know, it means like uh, doing more exercise so you can kind of live a little bit longer, eating the right thing. That's kind of the solving of death for most people. Uh, and, uh, but, and this is kind of, this is the sort of thing that makes the Buddha special. Uh, not the fact that he's flying through the air. Maybe he's flying through the air, that's kind of irrelevant. Uh, this is what is relevant. Uh, this is kind of what is the really cool stuff about Buddhism. So, um, again, uh, the idea here is that these things are really worthwhile reflecting on. Uh, and sometimes I would recommend you to reflect on this a little bit every day. Uh, yeah, every day you can start the morning just to make sure it is a really bright and nice morning, an optimistic morning. Start with reflecting on death straight away. Uh, yeah, Just to kind of make your day, as they say. Uh, <laughs> and if you do reflect on death in the right way, first thing in the morning, it is going to make your day. That is kind of the pro point. Uh, it is going to make a difference. Uh, I remember when I was in uh, Brisbane, I traveled also around Australia. Australia is this enormous place, so you, it takes four hours flight to fly from Perth, where I am, over to Sydney, for example, across the continent. Uh, so I was in Brisbane a long time ago, and there was a a psychologist, and he, had, he was of, of Sri Lankan background, lots of people of Sri Lankan background in Australia. And um, he said to me that every day in the morning, he reminds himself that he might die today. Yeah? And that meant that when he left his house, he left his wife and his children, he always left them on a good note, because he knew he didn't want to die with any regret in his heart. So he said to go goodbye to them in a good way, he didn't leave after an argument or anything like that. And this is the power of death contemplation. Uh, it reminds you of what matters. Uh, it reminds you of what is significant. Uh, you chuck out the nonsense uh, and focus on what is important in life. Uh, so use these contemplation in your life to make a change, uh, yeah, to actually uh, ennoble your own character as a consequence. Uh, so um, I We'll talk about these things in uh, quite a bit more detail, but that will have to be tomorrow, because there are some very interesting things uh, as part of this. Uh, but for now, it is uh, time to stop. Uh, so please uh, carry on enjoying yourself, uh, and then we'll come back to a guided meditation again at, in two hours' time at 7 o'clock.